Isn't it amazing? With a little bit of rock that contains uranium ore, you can produce electricity for everybody of you in this room? How does it work? Well, you got this uranium-235 that is being split and produces a chain reaction. Everybody learned that at school, that, you know, produces heat. With that, you can produce electricity. There's even a more amazing phenomenon, which is called breeding. If you use the plutonium that is generated in this process, you can even activate the uranium-238 that is contained in 99% of the uranium ore, and you can produce more fuel than you have initially. Right? So what's happening is that you increase the energetic use of the uranium ore to about 100 times the original one, and that means that in three grams three grams of uranium, you can have the same energy than you have in 10 tons of coal or that a wind turbine produces during a couple of days. Now, I just did a rough calculation. With these three grams of plutonium, you can generate electricity for everybody of us in this room for about two months. Wow. I think we've seen it. We want to preserve the Earth, right? We want to combat climate change. And I think there's a broad agreement that the use of fossil fuels needs to be stopped. It means coal, solar, wind, hydroelectricity, perhaps a little bit of bioenergy, <coughs> geothermal. And there's plenty of renewables around. Don't worry. So the question remaining is, do we still need nuclear power to combat climate change? And there's a couple of relatively strong stakeholder groups around that are in favor. And one is <coughs> probably the best known is the International Atomic Energy Agency that was set up in the 1950s to push countries to use nuclear power, and it's still around and still pushing countries to produce nuclear power. And they have predictions to the year 2050 that say we need more nuclear energy to combat climate change. There's a second group of stakeholders <coughs> that consists of um, uh, entrepreneurs, um, some startups that work together with public research institutions like Argonne National Laboratories or Idaho National Laboratories. Um, one of the more well-knowns are TerraPower, which is owned by, by Bill Gates, and uh, they work on nuclear power. And there's a third stakeholder group that consists of theoreticians, physicists, chemists, like my father, whom you see here, this is the guy standing with a tie, and what's similar between my father and Bill Gates? It's not the money. It's not the fame. It's the love for nuclear energy. When I was brought up, my father always told us, you'll see nuclear energy is going to save the energy problems of the world. Right? So it's not surprising that you see people that are engaged in that combat against climate change that say, well, probably we should use nuclear energy to succeed. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure in this room there are people that have this conviction and that's fine, we're here to debate. I am an industrial engineer. I'm a professor of political economy. And together with a couple of other people, I'm amongst the very rare nuclear economists in Germany and Europe and even worldwide. So what I'll do is I'll take a look at three aspects. One is technology, the second will be economics, and the third one is the global transformation that we need to succeed in that combat against climate change from a socio-political perspective. 
Let's start with the <coughs> technology. Nuclear power was developed to be dangerous. Back in the 1940s, in the context of World War II, nuclear power was developed as the child of science and warfare. Science, <coughs> because the scientific progress was just mind-boggling. Think of Becquerel, think of Marie Curie, think of Ernest Rutherford, think of Albert Einstein, <coughs> think of Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner. Here in Berlin, just down a couple of kilometers, Tila Le 63, Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner, together with colleagues, developed the first splitting of uranium. You can visit the site still today, and the same thing was going on in France and uh, in Italy. In the United States, at the University of California at Berkeley, Glenn Seaborg was the first to separate plutonium in 1940, same period. So the science married the military in the person of General Leslie Groves that was determined to produce the nuclear bomb in the Manhattan Project between 1941, and they succeeded in developing the atomic bomb, and they threw two of them, one on Hiroshima, and the other one on Nagasaki in August 1945, right? So nuclear power can be dangerous, and it is very dangerous. Um, <clears throat> and you know about accidents. Everybody has heard about accidents. Well, what you probably do not know is that since 1945, there have been accidents in commercial nuclear power every year, right? Because <clears throat> nuclear power is a very reactive process. This fission process can explode within less than a second if you can't control it. That's what happened in Chernobyl in 1986. Nuclear power generates a lot of heat, so it needs to be cooled permanently. And if that does not work, you can have a core meltdown. And that's what happened almost in uh, Three Mile Island in Harrisburg in 1979. And it happened three times in Fukushima in uh, March of 2011. The third aspect is that nuclear power is radioactive, so it emits <coughs> radioactive radioactivity. And uh, this not only in the present, but also in the long term. Plutonium, for example, has a half-life of 24,000 years. That is, <coughs> it's only decaying by 50% in 24,000 years, which means that even a million years from now, it will still have to be contained safely. Let me repeat. In a million of years, we still need to contain the plutonium in a safe way. Can you imagine how to save plutonium in a million of years? I can't. Will we still speak English at the time? Nobody knows. Are we going to put pictures on it to say, please don't touch? I don't know. So nuclear power is dangerous. Now you may say, okay, there are dangers, but we need to take these risks. So let me add two more things here. One is proliferation. Proliferation means the illegal trading of weapon-grade material like plutonium that is going on almost every day that has gone on for uh, several decades here, and we have, over time, built more than 500 tons of plutonium. That corresponds to more than 1,000 times the Nagasaki bomb. And as we speak, the amount is still rising because nuclear power is still being produced. If that's not enough, <coughs> let me ask you one last question. Are you willing to ensure me or Bill Gates or my father against the risks of nuclear accidents? No, you won't. Around the world, there's not a single company or a single insurer that would insure against nuclear accidents. Now, driving a car is dangerous, right? But you can insure against it. You can insure against fire at your home, but you cannot insure against nuclear accidents, so you better not use it. Second argument is, is economics. I told you in 1945, there was this moment when people were starting to think, well, what are we going to do with this? And 
the Navy, actually Admiral Hyman Rickover, said, why, why don't we try to produce electricity from that? So the first commercial nuclear power plant established in 1957 in Shippingport, Pennsylvania, was actually a little nuclear um, submarine reactor. And at the time, nobody looked at money. Nuclear power is, a, is an area where money plays no role. So it was more than five times more expensive than the corresponding generation of electricity from coal. And this has continued all through the decades. Actually, nowadays, um, an average kilowatt hour of uh, nuclear power is about four times more expensive than solar electricity. And uh, you may have heard of technologies that are being developed currently. And this will continue further because nuclear power is getting more expensive while the cost of renewables is decreasing. Solar is decreasing, wind is decreasing, so the difference between nuclear power and renewables is decreasing. So why would you use an expensive technology if you can have a cheap one? If you were to invest your own money into a nuclear power plant today, you would expect losses of several billions of dollars. And actually, that is what's happening currently. It's happening in Olkiloto in Finland, where there's a plant being built. It's happening in Flamanville in France. It's, it's happening in Vodal in the United States. So from an economic perspective, it doesn't make any sense to develop nuclear. Let me come to a third aspect here, which is the socio-political aspect. The fight against the climate crisis requires a large transformation within society. It requires changing the way we generate, that we use, and that we store energy. It requires not only to have this transformation in the global north, but also in the global south. It requires money to develop technologies, innovation, storage technologies, and others. Now, nuclear energy does not meet any of the three criteria. First of all, it is not a technology that's able to integrate citizens. On the contrary, it's a very top-down technology. It's a very masculine techno technology. It's a technology that always needs to be fenced, needs to be protective. So you can't have <coughs> any citizen engagement in that. If you look at the countries, and there's very few, actually currently it's only four countries that are working towards the first use of nuclear power. It's, it's Turkey, it's the Emirates, it's uh, Belarus, and it's Bangladesh. You'll find that they are characterized by a very low degree of liberal and democratic freedom. So nuclear power is not something that favors open society. Nuclear power wastes a lot of money in terms of subsidies and research money. And this research money spent on nuclear cannot be spent on other technologies, like, for example, storage technology, batteries, and others that may be needed more. And then there's the final aspect that also has the socio-economic political touch. There's about 200,000 tons of high-level nuclear waste laying around in all the countries, in the US, in Russia, in Europe, in Asia, etc. And there's not a single long-term geological depository to put this somewhere. The companies and countries have tried to develop one. The US in Yucca Mountain, Germany in Gorleben, Finland is approaching one, but it's not really yet there. And uh, there's also a socio-political aspect to it. It's very clear. Just imagine that you <laughs> were living on top of a favorable geological formation, right? And the government would come to you and tell you, well, we want to put the nuclear waste below your feet. 
Well, would, would you accept this? The first thing that you would say is stop producing more waste, right? Because the more waste you produce, the more I'm at risk. And so one of the preconditions of finding a safe nuclear storage is to stop producing nuclear waste and to stop producing nuclear electricity. Let me summarize here. Um, nuclear power is fascinating and it's theoretically one of the most amazing phenomena. It does not work in practice. It's too dangerous to be used. It's highly uneconomic and it's against the socio-ecological transformation that we need to combat the climate crisis. Thank you very much.